On December 20th, 2018, I propped myself up in bed with my laptop and blanket and pulled up the final episode of the just finished airing anime series Banana Fish. I was excited to watch the finale, sad that this amazing show was about to end, and anxious that something horrible would happen. I hadn't exactly been spoiled by manga readers, but they did give me reason to believe the show would end in tragedy. I fully expected a certain character to die during the action-oriented climax, and when they didn't, I actually wondered if the anime ending had deviated from the manga. It had not. Banana Fish is an action drama anime series produced by Studio Mappa that aired from July to December of 2018. It's based on the manga series by Akimi Yoshida, which serialized from 1985 to 1994. The series follows Ash Lynx, a 17-year-old white American street gang leader, and the close bond he forms with Eiji Okumura, a 19-year-old Japanese photographer's assistant. Banana Fish takes place in New York, a rather unique setting for an anime taking place in the real world. This setting situates the various heavy real-world topics that it covers, such as gang violence, drug trade, human trafficking, child pornography, and sexual assault. The anime series is critically acclaimed and widely beloved by audiences, though also a bit infamous for the soul-crushing emotional impact it has on its viewers, particularly in its final scene. As I mentioned at the beginning, the last episode of Banana Fish dropped in the United States on December 20th, 2018. I was home from college for winter break at the time, and I remember feeling genuinely depressed in the weeks that followed the finale, especially the first few days. My mom could even see it on my face and kept asking me what was wrong, but I was too embarrassed to admit that I was this depressed over the ending of a fictional TV show, an animated one at that. Even when I was back on my college campus, I remember having to explain away my occasional depressive funks as resulting from a lack of readiness to start the new semester. The finale of Banana Fish made me feel a deep and profound sense of sadness no other piece of fictional media had ever come close to achieving. Now, I'm a pretty easy target when a movie or TV show wants to make me cry. I've watched and cried over other anime known for being tearjerkers, like Clannad, Anohana, and A Place Further Than the Universe. All of these made me cry pretty aggressively, and can still get me to cry if I rewatch certain scenes. <clears throat> In fact, I would even say they all made me cry more than Banana Fish did. I actually didn't cry very hard when I finished Banana Fish. Instead, I just sat there, a bit dumbfounded, as though in shock, with a deep ache in my chest. I know I'm not alone in feeling this way. Earlier this year, MAPPA re-uploaded the Banana Fish openers to their official YouTube page, and I saw several comments from others expressing similar reactions and experiences upon finishing the show. The sentiments expressed in these comments aren't new to me. I've been seeing this response for years. If you're watching this, maybe you remember going through a similar sense of depression when you finished Banana Fish. If you watched the show around when it came out, you might even remember this article by the New York Post, published in November 2019, on the tourism boost that the show inspired. Japanese tourists are going bananas for the New York Public Library. Fans of the anime series Banana Fish are flocking to the booklender's flagship branch on Fifth Avenue to pay tribute to the main character, who dies sitting in a chair in the iconic Rose Main reading room. According to Anime News Network, Banana Fish's finale spurred enough tourism that Japan-based company Kinki Nippon Tourist Kanto led trip packages to New York City, bringing fans to various locations that appear in the show, including, of course, the New York Public Library. The tour bus bringing fans to these locations included guided commentary by Yuma Uchida and Kenji Nojima, the voice actors for Ash and Eiji. The tours concluded with a private dinner party and screening of Banana Fish's final episode. Probably the most well-known bit of information to emerge about this tourism boon is that several fans snuck red roses into the library to leave on a table in the Rose Main reading room as a memorial to Ash. According to the New York Post, the tourism boon also boosted gift shop revenues for the library, with staffers saying that many fans were buying the gift shop's $30 miniature rose room chair replicas. I've been in retail for 30 years and I've never seen a phenomenon like this, said Krista Roth, Associate Director of Retail Initiatives. Apparently, in fiscal year 2014, the library's gift shop revenue came in at around $2.8 million. In 2019, this doubled to nearly $5.6 million, and workers attributed this rise all to banana fish. This is another country and people are coming here to see the New York Public Library, Roth marveled. 
can we just take a moment to acknowledge how bonkers this is? For some additional context, Banana Fish is a shoujo series that could also fall under the subclassification of Shonen Ai, aka Boys Love, or simply BL. This is contentious, here's a video that talks more about that, but for now, let's just say that a lot of fans of BL adore Banana Fish, whether you would call it one or not. Now, BL is an extremely popular genre among women in Japan who consume manga and anime, but I've come to understand that in Japan, BL is something that is privately and discreetly enjoyed by its fans. Japanese women usually aren't publicly open about being fujoshi, which is a term for BL fanatics, and can even be anxious and secretive when purchasing things like BL manga at bookstores that openly sell BL manga. Yet this is an instance in which dozens upon dozens of Japanese women spent thousands of dollars to go on an international trip in a group in order to publicly celebrate and memorialize what could be considered a BL anime. <laughs> Now, I actually had a chance to visit New York earlier this year while I was working on the script for this video, and I, of course, had to undertake the pilgrimage myself. I had to go through two rounds of security and prove that I was there to get work done in order to even enter the Rosemain reading room, so by the time I found the spot, I was literally shaking with excitement and overwhelming emotion and just a general feeling that I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing. Well, I actually learned after that visit that these restrictions to the Rose Room are new and in place because of disruptions from all the Japanese tourists who were taking pictures, leaving roses, and sometimes sobbing loudly in the library. I even bought one of those stupid replica chairs and put it on my banana fish shelf. I love it, but I also hate it because when I really think about it, I'm reminded of how ridiculous this all is. Whenever I see people talk online about the phenomenon of banana fish fans leaving red roses in the library, they're always commenting on how beautiful that is. But like, is it? I hate to remind you guys of this, but Ash isn't real. Now, it's totally normal to be emotionally impacted by a piece of fictional media and the death of a fictional character. But to experience genuine depression for days, weeks, months after the ending of a show you really liked? To travel thousands of miles and create a real physical memorial in honor of someone who isn't real? But what really strikes me about that is that I was a part of this reaction. I may be chronically online, but I'm certainly not a hikikomori, so when I was depressed in the weeks that followed the finale, it really caught me off guard and I didn't know how to make sense of it. If you had a similar reaction, maybe you also felt embarrassed and had no idea how to explain why you were so impacted by this TV show. For me, it was an ache that no other show had made me feel so intensely, and as I said before, it took weeks for me to finally get out of the funk that it had put me in. It was completely different from my experience watching other emotionally intense, tear-jerking anime series, or any other piece of fictional media for that matter, and I couldn't understand why. I tried to explain away my unusually intense feelings by attributing them to the fact that this show involved serious real-world issues like human trafficking. Maybe it even hit close to home because I live in the United States and I've been to New York. But that didn't really feel like an explanation. That could all very well factor in, and there's certainly features that allow for this kind of response, especially the tourism and library memorial. But I don't think it's the main reason. Beyond that, I know what it feels like to be deeply moved by the depiction of a real-world issue, the sense of sadness, anger, and frustration that comes from witnessing injustice. That's also a very heavy feeling, but it's not the one I had when I finished Banana Fish or in the weeks that followed. No. When Ash slowly died from blood loss on a table in the New York City Public Library, the pain I felt was different. It felt like loss. It felt like grief. Plenty of movies and TV shows explore grief as a theme or depict characters going through grief or a grieving process upon the death of other characters. The idea of grief in fictional media is not new or unique, but I think there is something unique about Banana Fish, at least in the way I experienced it. In fictional media, most death scenes are set up in a particular way to drive plot developments and character arcs. Sometimes we see the death coming a mile away, and sometimes we don't expect it at all. But either way, we can usually make narrative sense of the death in the greater storyline. 
their death serves a purpose. Ash's death, however, seemingly doesn't. Ash had clear death flags, but it's the way he actually ended up dying after the climax and resolution of the main titular plotline that was so shocking. I would argue his death isn't completely pointless in a narrative sense, otherwise it would probably just verge on bad writing, which, to be fair, some people find it to be, but that's not what I'm here to argue. I've linked some threads below that talk more about narrative interpretation of the ending. However, in taking place at the very end of the episode after an action-packed climax and resolution, after you, the viewer, have been lulled into a sense of security and even shown a glimpse of a possible future where things work out, where Ash leaves his past behind and goes with Eiji to Japan, Ash's death delivers a sense of shock and unfairness that I think is akin to real-life experiences with sudden death and grief. That feeling where you question whether this is really happening, where you sit in denial, too stunned to fully cry or process this turn of events, where you think about all the ways this situation could have played out differently, or how such simple changes could have prevented all of this, where you wish in vain for a future that could have been. Banana Fish, in my opinion, actually manages to simulate personal grief in the viewer through the randomness and lack of purpose we find in sudden death. Now, the senselessness of Ash's death, caused by a mere miscommunication instead of central plot elements, is not the only reason I think this finale evokes a sense of grief in its viewers. Along with a seeming lack of purpose, the final scenes of Banana Fish also lack a proxy. Typically, grief in fiction is explored through a proxy character, or a character with whom the audience can empathize. We may feel sadness and anger and loss when a character we like dies, but the focus of the scene, the one carrying the emotional load, is often the character or characters left behind to grieve them. This also brings purpose to the scene, as the death will likely play a role in shaping that character and motivating some sort of character arc. For an example of this, we really needn't look any further than earlier episodes of Banana Fish itself. Take the death of Shorter Wong. Shorter's death is a devastating blow to the viewer, but more importantly, it's a devastating blow to Ash. When Shorter dies, we watch with horror as Ash is the one made to pull the trigger. We recognize that Ash has lost yet another loved one, and we empathize with Ash as he cries and shouts Shorter's name. Now, we may miss Shorter's presence as the show goes on, but we don't have a tangible sense of what the story could have looked like if Shorter had lived. Shorter served his purpose as a character, someone who humanizes Ash early on, who understands his world, and who can stand on equal footing with him before Eiji. Shorter's death has purpose in the plot as well, demonstrating the effects of the drug banana fish while also forcing Ash to grapple with his self-perception as a monster, thus heightening his inner turmoil. In this scene, Shorter is the one to die, but Ash is the one left behind to grieve him. Now, banana fish does have someone who would serve as the proxy character in its final scene, Eiji, but when Ash dies, Eiji isn't there. He doesn't even find out about Ash's death by the series' end, because Ash dies in the very last scene. By keeping Eiji out of this scene, all the grief that would have been felt through Eiji is just stuck inside of us. The viewer is the only witness to Ash's death at the show's end. This also means that there's no opportunity for catharsis in our viewing experience. Storylines including character death often include this catharsis. There's usually the immediate catharsis of seeing the proxy characters cry or just immediately begin grieving, and that can already feel conclusive enough. A lot of storylines involving death will have those proxy characters begin processing their grief within the story, even sometimes reaching a point where they can look back fondly on their memories with the dead character. In Banana Fish, we don't get that opportunity. Instead, we are left to undergo that process ourselves. Perhaps if Ash had died a more cinematic or sacrificial death during his final fight scene with Fox, his death would have felt more expected, more purposeful. I honestly thought as I was watching the series that the show might end with Ash sacrificing his life to save Eiji, followed by Eiji grieving and then going on to live and honor Ash's memory. This would have had all three elements, the purpose, the proxy, and even the catharsis. I probably would have cried, but I don't think I would have come away with the same deep ache and feeling of personal grief. 
I don't think I would have gone through a genuine period of mourning because, well, AG already did that for me. I would argue that the strongest emotion we feel in most scenes depicting a character death is not our own personal grief for the dead character, but a sense of sympathy or even empathy for the griever. Their tears trigger our tears. I don't think we are completely without an emotional response to the character that died. We've grown attached to this character. We may even feel something like loss if we have to continue the story without them. It can still be a powerful feeling, one that can bring tears to your eyes when you rewatch the scene or listen to the soundtrack or just think too much about it. But I would argue that it's a different feeling, not one of personal grief, but rather one of viewer empathy. That's what I think is so unique about the finale of Banana Fish. In taking away a clear sense of purpose, a present proxy, and the relief of catharsis, Ash's death manages to bring us past viewer empathy and into personal grief. It feels as though we have witnessed the death of someone we actually knew, rather than witnessing a story of death vicariously through another character. Recognizing that I went through a genuine period of mourning and understanding how that happened eventually helped me come to terms with the intense emotions I had upon finishing the show. Now, five years later as of this video's upload, I can still say I haven't watched or read anything that's made me feel the way Banana Fish did. I can look back fondly on an anime and manga that I love, and marvel at the impact it had on me, maybe you too, and so many others. Here's to Akimi Yoshida for her original manga, and to everyone at MAPPA who brought the show to life on screen. And here's to Ash, a character who will continue to live on in our memories.